not want this call. And that might have been that. We might never have heard of John Knox at all had it not been for another John, John Winram. Winram was to have a profound influence on in both the life of Knox and the progress of the Scottish Reformation. As a leading churchman, Windrum had taken charge in St Andrews following Beaton's murder until a new archbishop could be appointed. But unlike Beaton, he was already convinced of the need for reform. To encourage debate on the issue, he agreed to a series of public sermons in the parish church. It was here that Knox took to the pulpit for the first time. Whether the pressure from his fellows finally proved irresistible, or whether God had finally called him, John Knox eventually had to preach. And in his sermon, here in Holy Trinity St. Andrews, we hear for the first time the wrathful incantatory voice that was to change the history of Scotland. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him that sat on the horse and his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The first sermon that Knox preaches is very characteristic of Knox, full of fire, full of thunder, and linking it up with the imagery in the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, and talking about the Roman Catholic Church in terms of Antichrist. So this is just Knox as he appears for the rest of his life. Anti-Catholic, going straight for the heart of the matter, and full, as I said, of violent language and vehemence. There is salvation available! And God's word makes it clear. The 16th century was a period of great upheaval, both in Scotland and on the continent. With wars and religious persecution tearing Europe apart, it must have seemed to many people that the end of the world was truly nigh. Knox certainly seems to have interpreted his own age in this way. It probably accounts for the increasing ferocity of his language. Judgment was coming upon the world and people had to take sides. As far as Knox was concerned, there could be no compromise. You were either for God and the Protestant cause or against him. It's a kind of thinking that's still common currency. Islamic fundamentalists and some of the politicians in the West who oppose them often speak in apocalyptic terms of light versus darkness of good versus evil. In this great spiritual battle, Knox was convinced he was on the side of the angels. The dangers and difficulties he had suffered in the 18 months since he'd espoused the Protestant cause only made him more certain that he was right. He believed that he had found his vocation as a Protestant preacher and given encouraging developments in St. Andrews, it must have seemed to him as if reform of the whole Scottish church was just around the corner. But then the French fleet showed up and everything ground to a halt. Why the French? Well, St Andrew's Castle might be in the hands of the reformers, but Scotland was still very much a Catholic country. The widowed Scottish queen, the French-born Mary of Guise, had called on her countrymen to help her deal with these troublesome Protestants. Mary's marriage to the Scottish King James V had cemented an alliance between Catholic France and Catholic Scotland, symbolized by the birth of their daughter Mary, the future Queen of Scots. But her eventual accession was now under threat from the growing momentum of the Protestant rebellion. The French fleet bombarded the castle into submission. Now it was time to deal with these Protestant rebels. It's a strange fate for these Castilians who had all bonded together as fellow revolutionaries. 
they're divided up rather into gentlemen and players. The gentlemen are treated almost like honoured house guests. The riffraff, including Knox, are sent to the galleys. Nothing in Knox's life had prepared him for this. French galley ships of this time were about 100 to 150 feet long and about 30 feet wide. They were equipped with sails, but when the winds died, they relied on the rowers, six men fettered to each oar, who ate, slept, and relieved themselves where they sat. Under the watchful eye of his French Catholic guards, Knox could only seethe in silence. The firebrand preacher was reduced to sly and solitary acts of defiance. He tells us, for example, of him being given an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary to kiss, which he refuses to do, and then, having checked very quietly, looked from side to side to make sure no one was looking, throws it overboard. But he certainly checks beforehand to make sure he's not being watched. Although Knox would defy authority, he clearly had little appetite for physical danger, no martyr complex. He was never reckless enough to put himself in the way of pain or death. Nevertheless, his spirit was not broken. Through even these darkest days, when it looked as though Satan had won, he believed that in the end he would be defeated. Knox was finally freed from the galleys in February 1549, after 19 punishing months. By now, Scotland had been heavily reinforced by the French, so unwilling to risk returning to Scotland, Knox settled in England, in the border town of Berwick-upon-Tweed. England had become a refugee camp for reformers fleeing persecution. Here, the Reformation was flourishing under the young King Edward VI, and sandwiched between the two Catholic powers of Scotland and France, Edward's England was a thorn in both their sides. It was here that Knox sought sanctuary. Knox had learned a hard lesson. It must have seemed to him now that joining the rebels in the castle at St Andrews, confident of their ultimate victory, had been a grave miscalculation for which he'd paid a heavy price. It was a mistake he'd never make again. From now on, Knox would be a cautious man. He would go only where he was made to feel welcome. And in Berwick, he was made to feel very welcome. As a charismatic preacher, the 35-year-old Knox soon attracted around him a coterie of devoted followers, many of them women. Shortly after his arrival in Berwick, Knox was introduced to Elizabeth Bowes, the wife of an English officer at Nottingham Castle. It was to be the beginning of an intimate, lifelong relationship. Although Elizabeth wasn't much older than Knox, she had already borne her husband 15 children. She seems to have become a Protestant before Knox arrived in Berwick. But throughout her life, she struggled with doubts. It was to Knox she turned for reassurance and support. And Knox, who was so fierce and unyielding in his public pronouncements, was always gentle and understanding in his dealings with Elizabeth. In an age when most marriages were arranged, it was common for women to form close, emotional relationships with their parish priests rather than with their husbands, who saw marriage as a purely contractual arrangement. And it was natural that they would do the same with Protestant ministers like Knox. From the beginning, there were accusations of sexual impropriety. It was the intensity of their relationship that set tongues wagging. She was deeply emotionally dependent on Knox, but he was just as committed to her. I have always delighted in your company. And when labors would permit, you know I would spend hours talking and communing with you. Was there a sexual subtext to their relationship? 
there may well have been. There is, after all, a dangerously fine line between pastoral affection and passionate love. In my body, you think I am no adulterer. Let that be. But the heart is infected with foul lusts. Externally, I commit no adultery, but my wicked heart loveth the self and cannot refrain from vain imaginations. Nevertheless, their affection and need for each other was controlled by their sincere religious convictions. However, Knox's marriage to Elizabeth's daughter Marjorie would ensure that they never would be separated. As a poor preacher, Knox could never really have hoped to propose to Marjorie, and when she mentioned it to him, Captain Bowes opposed the match. But Elizabeth was determined to make it happen, and happen it did. Knox and Marjorie were betrothed. So Elizabeth managed to remain an intimate part of Knox's life till the day she died, even if it was as his mother-in-law. I don't think that we could see within Knox's relationship with his wife and his mother-in-law our normal picture of domestic bliss. But it is obviously a relationship which is intellectual, which is a meeting of minds as well as of spirits. England also took Knox to her heart. The Reformation there had the full backing of the King Edward VI and Knox's impressive and fiery preaching skills were soon noticed at court. Invited to become a royal chaplain, he accepted the post. But for Knox, change was being introduced too slowly, and the Edwardian church compromised by the continuing influence of some less than godly royal advisers. Knox could have been forgiven for feeling quite satisfied with his life. He had found acceptance in England, he had the ear of the king. He was surrounded by devoted followers and adoring women. He was engaged to be married, and he was financially secure. All was set fair, yet he was filled with a terrible sense of foreboding. If you, O oh England, for any respect, delay your repentance and conversion unto God, if you shall retain in honor and authority such as have declared themselves enemies of God, then I and others who faithfully have warned you of your duty and of vengeance to come shall be clean of your blood. He believed that it was only a matter of time before God would wreak his vengeance on faithless England. Sure enough, the following month, the king died. Overnight, everything changed. Edward, the great Protestant hope, was succeeded by his half-sister Mary, but unlike her brother, Mary was a committed Catholic. Upon her accession, a campaign of terror was unleashed in her goal to restore England to Roman Catholicism. Protestant literature was destroyed and preachers burned as heretics. To Knox, it looked like the end of the world. The new queen was to become known as Bloody Mary and for good reason. She set about expunging all evidence of Protestantism. These were dangerous times for Protestants in England. What did Knox do? What he always did. When the going got tough, he got out. As Protestants burned, Knox fled to the continent, leaving behind the people who had taken him to their hearts. He was insistent that they should remain true to their newfound convictions and defend the fledgling Protestant church, despite the dangers they now faced. But from his letters, it's clear that he felt uneasy about abandoning his beloved English sisters and brothers. If I thought that I might have your presence, I would jeopardize my own life to let men see what may be done with a safe conscience in these dangerous days. But seeing that it cannot be done instantly, without danger to others than to me, I will abide the time that God shall appoint. You can almost hear him squirm, can't you? He knew how bad it looked. Here he was telling them to stay and face the terrors of Mary's England, while he himself was writing to them from the safety of the continent.
But although he was telling his friends to stay put in England, he did arrange for...